attendees are in listen only. Yeah, yeah, the first two years are kind of pulling around and trying to wait for this. <laughs> kind of pull, you're pulling around trying to figure out how things are going to work in the five years. And so, so um, we're 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 in that stage. We had a we had actually released I think the very first basic um, uh, I2B2 instance. And so, um, and so that was what they adopted for, with J and J. And I mean, a lot of things changed in in, in I two B two, of course, after that adoption. And um, some of that um, uh, they used, but a lot of it they didn't. And then Paul came, and Paul has actually been the most instrumental in the entire history of this platform to uh, now realign this and. The reason that's so important has been emphasized repeatedly by Brian and by Zach, but the fact is that um, um, you know that the, 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 they're they they occupy such uh, they give such force to the combination of the two that we just really have to bring that out. And that's what I'm going to do with these slides. So first, I want to talk about what I2B2 and Transmart already really share. And the first thing is just this common goal, which is getting data to the fingertips of researchers. And you might think that that's a no-brainer, but you know, most uh, database kinds of oriented projects do not have that as their goal. Their goal is get it to themselves, right? So they have these databases and they keep it in their own lock and key, and you know, they can do these mm -hmm. SQL queries, and then they'll show you stuff, and they're like, see, isn't that cool? And they publish some papers, like, oh, that's really great, right? And you're like, oh, yeah, well, I'd like to do that. And they're like, oh, no. <laughs> Uh, you're not in the club, right? And so we have that in this group as one of the things that uh, we share, and we can uh, form these high get high quality data uh, and make it available for genomic queries. And we have these client plugins and extensions that let people work with the data, and that's a critical one. And then we have a common approach to the ontology-driven modeling of data. Now. For those that are really familiar with, you know, I2B2 and Transmart, it kind of looks all the same. It's like, of course, you know, you're going to have a, a, a concept in your fact table and it's going to, you know, have a metadata in the ontology table and that's going to tell you how to do queries and so forth. But that is not the way that most things actually run. Most things have their codes embedded in tables. You have to, like, look them up on a little chart or something. And, um, and they all have to be just one very specific kind of coding system which is extremely limited, right? Uh, where you can only have ICD-9 columns and codes in this table. And if you have registry you know, data, which is like you know, different codes that you know, they haven't seen before in a standard coding system, you're cooked. And of course, since that's the business of, um, of doing uh, patient-oriented analysis and genotyping, um, that means that those things are out trying to do it with some kind of standard database. And so, and then just to make sure that we're on the right track and that we're not inventing something new from an engineering point of view, because I certainly was no engineer, uh, I was a neurologist. And, uh, but I read, I can read, and I can read the books of Ralph Kimball, who at that time uh, was coming together with his red brick and so forth, and uh, really, uh, allowing us to understand how optimizing a database so it can create a really fast index was the key to performance. So we have paved through, we have, we have the, the, the concept of Ralph Kimball and dimensional modeling, which lets us, lets us take tables of 10 billion rows and do queries in milliseconds. And that's very important for EHR data because it's very copious. You get billions and billions of concepts and rows and facts out of EDHRD. And so this is accommodated with the star uh, model and the concept. And then finally, we have the patient-oriented approach to creating a fundamental fact, which is that row in the fact. So, this is kind of what the client looks like in um, I2B2. Like Transmart, so we tend to brand it for every different application. So the basic thing that's the same, pretty much, because nobody wants to rebrand their 
change that is this area here, where it's just like Transmart, you have your uh, attributes of your patients, and then you, these don't look like two columns, it's just one panel trying to be a Venn diagram, basically. So if you wanted to find, for example, this SNP, um, and find out how many patients had that SNP in, uh, as a pentacellus um, uh, entity, then you would pull that in, say run query, and it would give you the number of patients. And you can do this in all kinds of different complexities. You can add uh, carefully phenotyped uh, calculations, like these curated disease populations. Use those just like any other query. And this is of no surprise to you all, but we show this at these standard databases, and they're like, well, where's the standard? We're like, no, no, these are the, this is the real quality data here. You know, you talk about quality, what you really want to know is have a machine calculated, machine learning calculated uh, uh, phenotype on a patient using all the data in the EHR on that patient, similar to how a doctor, by the way, works, right? They take in all the stuff about the patient, they pull out features of the patient, and they take out, consider all the features of the patient with the of their phenotype. Um, and that's what these machine learning algorithms can do. But then they encapsulate it all in these columns, in these oncology items that you can use for queries, just like any other one. And there's various ways that you can create plugins and extensions, which um, we have our plugin library. And you can, for example, take a timeline plugin and show all the data for the patient in a timeline for the specific concepts that you might be interested in. And then the data model for the two looks similar, right? So we have this idea that the data can be captured from many different ontologies. And we can put many different ontologies in a common uh, fact table. And that allows us to do this data integration in a way that's not possible with any other platform other than, uh, I should say, common popular platforms, other than Transmart and I2B2. We, um, abide by this principle that we're going to separate the data. We're not going to use the EHR data in place. You're not going to use the transactional tables in place. You're going to import them into these uh, databases that are for analysis and have the star schema. And we can standardize, therefore, the model across the various EHR and, and registry systems. And they're easy to use by the end users because we can put query tools on top of them. And we use this idea of dimensional modeling where we have a fact table in the middle that has all of the data and then the dimensions that kind of hang off of them. They give you descriptions of the data and help you do queries against them. And in I2B2, it looks like this. It looks very similar, I think, to uh, um, uh, Transmart, with maybe a few columns in the observation table, which are uh, a little different, or use a little differently, I should say. And uh, that might not sound like a big deal, but it is, because that makes it so it's not perfectly aligned. And that's what Paul has been working on with his team for the past two or three years align this so that we can truly interoperate uh, with two systems like to be to and transport in a very transparent way. Then you have the dimensions that hang off, which include things like the concept and the concept path, right, which is what we actually use in our theory. And then we use the theory of Kimball to create these enormous indexes on the back tables that might be many, many billion rows uh, uh, deep, but that uh, can therefore be queried very quickly. And the concept dimension, of course, looks like these paths that can let you uh, have any level of granularity along a concept and represent it and in the table that allows you to do queries. Um, allows you to do queries of lots of different varieties. And of course, it ends up looking like these folders, which reminds you a lot of you know, the kind of uh, folders that you see in a file system. And the paths kind of look like the, 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 the files in a Linux file system, right? So it's a, it's a familiar model, and yet it's very powerful in being able to drill in and use various kinds of granular hierarchical concepts in a query. And then we have this idea of a fact table, which in the I2B2 world includes things like uh, uh, diagnoses and procedures, the time they had the procedure, the time they had the lab, uh, done, what the value of the lab was, and so forth. In uh, Transmart, it's usually more, it's diagnoses, but they come from a registry rather than an EHR. Sounds pretty similar, and it is. So, very artificial distinction there, I would say. Um, and so these are the kinds of things you'll find in the back table. Um, and then, 
we have these columns in the fact table, which are very similar to the columns that the courts will find in the transform fact table. And then we have the various value columns, which can represent the numbers and so forth, which are very similar to the transform value columns. So the message I was trying to convey was Transmart and I2B2 are already very similar, both in mission and in the actual data models and capabilities. And so um, we're starting with some very good fodder um, that has proved its performance worthiness and its flexibility. Okay, so now what does I2B2 have that can pretty much almost be immediately used by Transmart uh, if we do some of the detailed alignment that Paul's been working on for, for some time. Well, so first we have this thing called the Shrine, which allows us to do clinical trials like Ryan was talking about. And the idea is, so in I2B2 we have these software modules. So we tend to divide the software up into these modules because then it's easy to install one module on top of another and they communicate with each other using web services. So that you can have somebody sitting in children's hospital it can compose a message, and this broadcast module can send that web service message out to all the different hospitals. They'll run it in their I2B2, and it could be an I2B2 transmart instance at each place, and then they will come back with the answer, and it will display that to this fortunate person sitting at Children's who's done the query. And so by doing that, you actually can form a query across all the sites. The query is actually done at each site and the aggregate result comes back. And it looks kind of like this, right? So you've done, it looks just like your query tool that you see. And here we've done a query for hepatitis C where we have uh, put all the different ways of saying hepatitis C in the, in the ontology into this uh, one circle of the Venn diagram. And when we run the query, we get the result of all the different um, uh, uh, first people who are in the uh, network. And the idea then is that you can run this simple query as a predecessor to doing a clinical trial. Because now you know how many patients there are at every place, but beyond that, you now have formulated a little uh, bird dropping of a query at each uh, site that it reached out to to do the query and get those numbers. And that bird dropping stays there at each site so you can rerun it at the site if you want to, to do exactly the same query. But now you can drill into the data and you can get not just aggregate obfuscated results, which for patient privacy reasons are very important to just allow that capability at the, uh, you know, when you get the aggregate data and you're reaching out to the various hospitals and seeing it at children's. But now, when you can go in at each hospital to be part of this big clinical trial across hospitals, you can drill into the data. And you can either take that uh, 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 bird dropping of a query and just get the patients out of it and say, okay, these are the patients at our site using that query that have hepatitis C because you're just running it again in your I2B2 or I2B2 Transmart. And then you would um, get your list of patients, essentially, and you can go to your Epic EHR, your Cerner EHR, your Athena EHR, HR, wherever it is, whatever it is, and look up the patients and see if they're suitable for the clinical trial. And then you'll see we've also built out tools in I2B2 that specifically allow you to do medical record review. And so you log into the Shrine workbench, you repeat the query, essentially, and then you can look at the patients, so you can output the, the medical record numbers of the patients, or you can actually look at the patients in these familiar kinds of Excel output tools. And it will tell you things like, you know, what the patient ID is, and you know what some of their demographics are, and then what all the different uh, uh, attributes that they might have or not have. And you can even, so you click on this little star here, and some of you might recognize that's the smart star to the smart project. And when you click on that, you can actually bring up this embedded smart screen where apps, where apps, and you'll see this is the same app that Zach showed you and that was transportable amongst various applications, including the EHR, and in this case, the I2B2 web client as well. And so you can bring up this collage of apps, there's vital science app here, to look at the data on your patients and review it so that if you don't 
you want to go to Epic and review it, you want to use some special tools, you can build them into apps and use those to kind of record review at each site. And here's an app that's specifically built to kind of do the pre-screening for you. So it actually gives you a nice check if it goes in and pulls out the right things in the notes, for example, that indicate that this person has wheezing asthma. Um, so you can like read it really easily and it can find out if you have the medications that are required in the trial and so forth because you built this app for this clinical trial and then you distributed it to all your sites. You might say, well, it's really hard to build an app, but it's not. It's actually not hard at all. And not only that, but it's really fun. And so you get to build the app and then you get to watch everybody using the app to save themselves, you know, 10 or 100 times the effort that they would have had to put in otherwise without the app. So, um, so this allows you to do clinical trials uh, much more effectively using that kind of um, approach. Okay. The second thing that I2B do can immediately allow Transmart to do, if we align things, is that we have this concept that although we all like our data model, right, we think it's the best, sometimes a project comes along and it wants you to put things in a different data model because it wants to uh, do an analysis that they've already pre-built for that. So they want it in a mini Sentinel data model, or they want it in a PCORnet data model, or they want it in an OMOC data model. And so your task then becomes, I got to put it into this data model to be part of the network. And I have I2B2, or I have I2B2 transmark. What do I do? And so what it does is it says, no problem. Build an ontology that corresponds to what they expect in PCORnet or in OMOP uh, or Mini Sentinel. And then we have a transformation that we will build for you. And we won't build it for you. You, but someone in your in your team, right? So in Vicori, what we do is we built this transformation that can take your ontology that you have mapped to your local terms, and it works perfectly to do your I2B2 queries and do them in I2B2. But Vicornet doesn't want to just do I2B2 queries; they want to do queries on this common data model. So the transform will take your special ontology and see we built a special ontology here just for Vicornet. It lives perfectly well alongside all the other ontologies in I2B2 or in that case, or I2B2 transform. But the ontology, which is mapped to your terms, will be used by the transform to take the data out of the I2B2 or I2B2 transform data model and then transform it into the PCORnet data model so that now you can run all the algorithms in, in PCORnet that you need to do to be part of that network. The same thing happens can be done for OMOP and Mini Sentinel and, and, and data model X and Y that come up next uh, tomorrow, right? When we, when we open up our web browsers to find the latest announcement for some reason. PMI, I guess it's good, right? Okay. So then finally, taking this idea that um, you want to host lots of different kinds of data and that Although you, you want the different kinds of data in your network, a lot of times it takes a special team to build up a database of that data. So at Partners Healthcare, for example, we have a genomics team, and they love genomics, but they don't know or care about EHR data. And so we can give them a task, which is put that data into a I2B2, I2B2 transmark data model. It's actually not that difficult conceptually because really annotations, and you all know this sometimes, annotations are just repeating over and over. So you can put the annotations in the fact table. It works really well. And um, But that can be their only task and they don't have to coordinate at all with the rest of the teams. And the way that we then put their data together with all of the other data in the entire network is that we have a distributed query system. And Paul, are you going to talk about this at all? Or? Uh, no. No, okay. Well, not, not this time. Not this exact one. Yeah. So, but um, Paul and I are working on this in our picture um, uh, grant, uh, NIH grant, for big data technology. And what happens is that the, um, let me get my cursor back here. So I can move this back. And 
And um, so what happens is you do the query in the client, and everything, it looks to the, to the person doing the query, it looks just like any other query that they're doing in the query tool going against the I2B2, I2B2 Android database. And it goes into here, into, into this software, this, this hive. We call something the hive. I know you have a hive as well, but in I2B2 we have, we call the hive this group of software that kind of operates on a database. So it includes, you know, what we call the clinical research chart, which is the data repository software. It includes the ontology software. And we modularize everything this way so that people can build a new one if they want to. And then we have a project management cell. We have like several different kinds of uh, natural language processing cells. We have key identification cells. We have uh, cells that uh, can get access data file systems. So there's lots of different kinds of, you can just go and build a new module. Some do things like very specific, like they analyze pulmonary function tests. And they, if the pulmonary function test is in this format, you can send a pulmonary function test report to it, and it will send you back the decretized, uh, the discrete values, right, out of the pulmonary function test that you can then put in the back. So this, um, this, we call that a high. And all that, but here we have actually several highs. We don't just have one. And so, for example, here the genomic people own a high. They can actually do queries against their high on their own if they want. And that would be just fine. I'll show them you doing them them doing that, but then they can say, I want to join this distributed query system, and people are going to be able to go to the this node here, and this main node is going to be able to farm out queries to these separate independent hives, one of which is specialized just to do nodes, one specialized just to operate with biobanks, one just for genomic data, and one has the clinical data. And they're going to be able to do all those queries and come back with the answer by combining the patients into one big Venn diagram answer. Right. And then it will tell you how many patients uh, correspond to all those different attributes that you use in your query. So what exactly? And you have this compendium of different kinds of hives that um, can go from, you know, coded data, like you have an EHR types of hives, you have a I to be to ingest coded data, or you can have this highly specialized data like the genomic data. Sometimes you have a high of just unstructured test data. You can have, we have a radiology database that has features that we pick out of the images, kind of like Brian was actually describing in his uh, uh, talk. You have this, uh, you can put your calculated phenotypes into a database. So if you have a, an analytics center and they want to produce data, they don't have to worry about putting it into the entire huge database, they can put it in their own database and do a distributed query to it. And you can have sometimes patient databases that are actually very small that want to live in the hive so that they can, or in the distributed query system, so they can be used for queries in the hive. So we all know what the EHR database is. Here's an unstructured text database. It basically allows you to do a, use this new section here called the note search. And by by using that ontology item in a query, you drag it over into one of the panels. It allows you to specify unstructured text, just type stuff in, and then it will become just another data element which says, you know, okay, do a search in LMR notes, which is our medical record system, for these textual terms. And then you'll say run, and what it's actually doing when you say run, though, is it saying, okay, I'll do the structured data parts here, but for the text parts, I'm going to farm that out here. I'm going to run that, you know, I want it to have Parziga or those other terms. Find me all the patients that have those five terms in their notes, and then bring me back a set of patients, like a list of patients, to this database, and I can combine it with the other results from the other panels in that intersecting, you know, Venn diagram, and then I'm going to give you one answer, which is, uh, before you, you had structured text, it was 414, and now that you added your, your, your full text query, you get 727 patients as a result. So here's, that's just an example of how we've implemented doing the unstructured text high and make that part of the distributed query system. And then here we have a genomics query. And you see, all we have really in this high is uh, 
the capability to do a biobank genomics search. So it's just genomics data in this hive. And here I want to say, give me all the genes of the uh, 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 variants of the EGFR gene that are homozygous, and I checked off basically all the ones that cause a protein altering consequence. And then put those all here, so you can see here's the list of the consequences that I'm looking for, which are all just the protein altering ones. And then I can say run query, and I'll get the number of patients that have that uh, uh, EGFR uh, protein altering uh, variants, homozygous variants um, um, in it, that number of patients. But uh, the good news, of course, is that this database isn't, although it gives you really fast results on almost 2 billion variants that it has stored in the back table, it, uh, its magic is it, it's going to be able to combine with all of the other data through that distributed query system because it's going to be able to farm queries that come in here with the genomic variant data is going to be able to be farmed out to that genomic repository that's specialized for doing those queries. And then here, sometimes you have data which is very fluid, and that is actually very familiar to Transmart, but the ITB data that's not familiar at all, by the way. That was a big feature in Transmart that just, just put Transmart here, by the way, and um, you can see, we actually, we, we, I went to a European meeting with uh, Paul uh, last year, and we listed, uh, and, I, and I saw this brisket team. This brisket team had a really cool application, which is you can upload an Excel spreadsheet that looks like this. You have to format it, very familiar to you all, I think. You know, you format with the patient identifiers over here, and then the ontology items you want over here, and the date you want associated with your uh, facts over here. And then you can say import, and it will create your ontology, and you can use it in a query such that is the answer to the query. Anyway, so you can run the query and actually give you two patients out of that, out of that, that spreadsheet. You can do it. But um, this is very similar to that import. It's, 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 it's not as good, actually, as the import uh, functions that you have in Transmart to deal with these kinds of flat spreadsheets and pivoting them into the data model. Um, but I just wanted to point out how valuable that is to be able to infuse that into this network then you can put your own personal data right into the network to query with all the other big data that you have. And then finally, we have this radiology system, which actually goes to the DICOM headers, puts them in Hadoop, and extracts them, uh, puts them into MongoDB, and then puts the features of them that it finds interesting from this, this Hadoop uh, parallelization uh, process, extracting the features into a uh, fact table. It looks just like I2B2 and I2B2 to to Transmart, so then you can use these um, extracted features from your images into your queries. <coughs> and then you can put your computed phenotypes. We have this machine learning method to compute phenotypes, which uh, Brian actually talked quite a bit about too, where we do supervised learning, and Zach talked about this a lot, and I think Kat's going to talk to you about this too. A little bit, okay. So I'm not going to bore you all with this because, uh, so actually, not going to, it's like super exciting. Um, right. The point is, again, this is, this is the way doctors actually work in their heads when they're trying to diagnose a patient. They look at the patient and they look at different features on the patient, right? And they say, you know, what's important to pay, you know, is that I look at their eyes and that I look at the wrinkles on their skin and I look at their liver function tests and I look at their pulmonary function tests. And therefore, I can determine if they have uh, Tay-Sachs disease, let's say. And the, um, and the point is that this is going to be the same thing. So it's saying, look, give me a bunch of Tay-Sachs disease patients to begin with. Now, tell me what features are, are the computer should pull out of the medical record that are important to kind of calculate whether somebody has Tay-Sachs disease or not. And then it says, okay, once you give me those features, I will compare the features to the super, to the set that you specifically labeled as having TSACs and not having TSACs. It's very important to have not TSACs, so all TSACs in, in your test set. In order to do a calculation where we use Lasso, which is just a, uh, a logistic regression 
but that uh, has a shrinkage associated with it so that you know that potentially hundreds of features that you kind of are candidates don't um, all end up in your in your algorithm at the end. Typically, we'll only end up with four or five features uh, that are important, like just the LFTs and just the PAPTs are important to turn up to do the calculation and separate in a calculated way all the patients who did and did not have ASAP disease in a machine learning approach. And you can get incredibly accurate um, uh, results. Not only are they incredibly accurate, but you know how accurate they are. You have air bars, which you never have in EHR data. You don't know what the air bars are around your codes. This gives you air bars around all of your data, so you know how accurate they are. And you can tell exactly what the cost predictive value is. In this case, it's uh, um, my eyes are really terrible. 95%, right? It's the cost predictive value of that ROC curve. And we use this in the biobank. So we actually have, you see, all of those, and actually different positive predicted values can be calculated for each one of the different, uh, in this case, coronary artery disease or for depression. And that way, we can help Brian and allow him something that he can use in a query that actually can say, even though it's terribly messy to have depression in the EHR, and often it's wrong, when we do this calculated, um, uh, approach to determining if a patient has depression by pulling out all the different features that might be going from the EHR that might tell us they have depression. You can get incredible accuracy, right? So you can get up to 90% uh, in this case. For, for coronary artery disease, we, we, we have a 97%. Now you see the trade-off is, of course, the more accurate you get, or the higher the specificity is, the higher the positive predictive value is, the less patients you have, right? Because you, you're sure of less things. You're, you have, um, and you're really trying to be sure, right? Um, so we, we can actually just know that's correct. So we know it's correct, Gil, because here we've actually done the regression, right? So we do tenfold validation on it. And then we plot that into an ROC curve, and we just pick different points along the ROC curve in order to calculate those patients. So we so so here what we've done. Is here we picked, you know, uh, one of the one of the points way down on the ROC curve, very high in specificity, uh, uh, relatively low in sensitivity, and that's why you're getting a smaller number here. But um, not much. Not, yeah, no, it, it, you're right. It's not much smaller. So it's fairly steep. Right? Um, and so, but it it allows you to take this quantitative scientific approach to EHR data, which um, you know. Is, is important because EHR data can be so messy. So, Sean, you had a training set and then supervised learning, then turned into this and got the upper. Correct. That's cool. Okay. That's exactly right. Uh, and then everybody who uses you know ITB to ITB to transform doesn't have to understand those concepts. They can just use that in a query, just like any other item, right? They would use in a query um, when they're doing their. Um, their logic. And you can see we think we have this variable which is um, the uh, uh, positive predicted value of something like this. Okay. So in summary, right, we actually have this machine learning algorithm that can be effective. We apply to large populations to accurately phenotype the patients, providing flexibility and being able to adjust sensitivity and sensitivity and specificity <coughs> to varied use cases. Um, and allow these, these algorithms to be run um, at different, uh, for different uh, sets of sensitivity and specificity as you might need for your project um, that you can make available in, these, um, in the query tool for people to use in their um, I2B2 uh, and I2B2 Transmart uh, user interfaces. So, at the end of the day, we can not only, uh, we have some immediate benefits from putting together I2B2 and I2B2 transform. We're already most of the way there. And thanks to Paul and, and the work of his group, we're getting, we're like really almost all the way there. Um, so we have the same kind of goal, which is getting data to the fingertips of researchers. 
We approach an ontology-driven modeling of our data, so it gives us a lot of flexibility uh, in, in, in the way that we can host lots of different kinds of data in a very um, highly high-performing uh, uh, table using theories of database uh, and, and the construction of databases that really allow us to take advantage of indexing and um, and the full capabilities of a relational analytic system. And we have this common approach to the fundamental fact of um, healthcare um, based around the patient. And then immediately, I2B2 can share with Transmart the ability to join uh, a shrine uh, when we create uh, research networks. To be able to use the I2B2 ontology driven data transformations like going into the coordinates. So if you, if you have it looking like the I2B2 table, which is almost the way it is, you can then just use your ontology, build an, a pcornet ontology, or just use one of the ones that we publish. Actually, we publish a pcornet ontology so that you can transform your data into something that could be part of the pcornet, which is very uh, important for something like the patient uh, driven registries that we have in the pcornet. And um, one can participate in these enterprise distributed query systems. Um, of specialized data, um, and we can use I2B2 to generate um, our computed uh, data. And of course, there's many, many other possibilities um, that we can develop. And I, I really, I'm only looking at the one side of the coin, because that's kind of my job today, was to try to convince you that um, from the I2B2 point of view, um, it would be really good to join with I2B2. We understand already the, the, how great it would be to join in with Transmart. So, um, or, you know, since I'm here, right? So you're all sitting there just, just, just trying to understand, well, would it be worth you know, joining with I2B2 or not, right? And that's my explanation there. I already know how, how worthwhile it would be to join with Transmart, and I'm going to join with Transmart. We have to convince here. So anyway, um, the, um, I think that we're in a, in a privileged state to, to be in this situation. And um, here's some of the many people that work on our I2B2 system that actually um, did the real work. So thank you all. Is there one question? <clears throat> yes. Why haven't we done this already? Why haven't we done it already? We're just time. It's just time, time and money. Time and money. Well, I think we can solve it. <laughs> so, Sean, was your type? So, the data integration piece, you know, extending hives or creating new hives, I can definitely see that. Uh, about the analytics and organizing the analytics, you know, extending the analytic capability from the old I2B2 transform frame, you know, is that with the smart? Do you think about that from the point of view of smart? Absolutely. Architecture, so, I mean, I'm just picking it up. But it's just kind of so, yes, I think so. In terms of what does I2B2 and I2B2 transform? potentially contribute to the clinical decision support system of the world, right? Now, I would say um, the most important capability is the ability to look in these databases for similar types of patients and then explore what their outcomes were. You know, either the pharmaceuticals, what was the kind of you know testing pathway that was that was the quickest yield to take those patients down uh, so you, you know, don't waste a lot of time on expensive tests. Um, you can say, you know, what was the penetrance of the variant, for example, if you want similar patients that have similar. Let me, let me jump into the first one for a second and you mentioned outcomes, because this is something that I've been, and there was a recent paper, I think, in, I want to say Gamma, in the psyche, about, you know, how much missing data there really was in the EMR about the psych, psychiatric, uh, you know, kind of acute psychiatric uh, Episodes which happen locally and don't make their way into the electronic health record. It's a perfect article to read. But I keyed in on your um, 
use the word outcomes because one of the things that we're really worried about if the drug, you know, outcomes to a certain drug therapy, say, in psychiatric clinics, um, you know, outcomes are not generally recorded in the game. I mean, you know, it's a transaction system. You know, I, we're looking for it. I mean, this is a. a, a so, I'm serious. So let me let me let me beg to differ with you. But so it's correct that they're not explicitly reported in the drug as the patient had a good outcome to this drug and not a good outcome to that drug. So what you have to do if you wanted to, for instance, see if somebody was treatment resistant to depression, would would be you'd have to watch to see did they get switched to a whole bunch of different drugs so, right, exactly. over over a short period of time yep. and then they got ECT. No, right. I understand. That's I a treatment failure. That kind of analysis right now. I, that's yeah. for the whole, I get that, but and, and it's, you're saying it's implicit, and then you have to analyze it out of uh, I, with a certain degree of confidence or lack thereof. Exactly. I'm saying you have to do a lot of work to get that data out. I think that a lot of times there, there is this approach that. You know, oh, it's just you know all there, and just you know look to see if they if it says they have depression, and there you go. It's not and coded. It's not. So so depression, we actually looked at to see you know if you're coded for depression at a visit, what's the chance that you have depression? It's almost a random mix. Almost See, random this is of course bigger yeah. than depression or psychiatric. But if you do this, you know, and you use machine learning, you can actually get that up to eighty six percent positive. So it's it's just like a doctor. You have to use all the data. You can't just use one thing and think that you're going to get something out of just one observation. You have to use all the data. Uh, including data that isn't in your own EHR, but you know, Very possibly. Extended across the and, and, and not, and perhaps not even EHR typical data. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Gun health data. Uh, genomic data for sure. Right? Imaging data for sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ricardo who is full time professor of biomedical informatics and chair of the Center for Health Technology at the University of Pavia in Italy. Ricardo has been an outstanding collaborator for the ITB2 team, making huge developments in creating extremely useful plugins to the ITB2 framework in order to make real biomedical discoveries. So it's a, a, an outstanding presentation looking forward to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, well, after uh, 